So uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to the lecture by Catherine Dwyer and Chris Perry. And uh, the lecture, this lecture is the third one in uh, a series of eight lectures that we're very pleased to be able to offer virtually as part of our educational programming here at T-Space this summer. My name is Irini Tsachelia and I'm a practicing architect and educator in New York. This summer I've joined T-Space as a director of educational programming and I've been involved with T-Space as an instructor for the architecture residency program since the start of the, the program uh, about four years ago. Now, I am currently in New York, uh, uh, in Rhinebeck, New York, and I'm uh, co-hosting this event uh, with Celia. I'm hosting from um, within the archive and library building that uh, was designed by Stephen Hall very recently. And um, here, here I am. You can see lots of models. Um, uh, part of the models, there are more. Uh, further in uh, that you cannot see right now, as well as drawings and, and books uh, by Stephen Hall. Um, it's very inspiring to be here. Um, now, um, I, I wanted to, to introduce also our co-host, as I mentioned, Celia Barkley. So she is the residency host and administrator for the lecture series. For our new audience, very briefly, um, I wanted to introduce T-Space, which is a non-profit organization. It focuses on arts, education, design, and ecology. And it is an initiative of the Stephen Myron Hall Foundation. The programming of, of T-Space supports really the coming together of the arts, art, architecture, poetry, and um, photography, and music, and it includes art uh, exhibition, um, music events, poetry readings, and of course the architecture residency program, which takes uh, place once a year during the month of July. And as we already have been discussion, discussing, it takes place virtually this summer for the first time. So um, the lecture that you're joined today uh, by Catherine and Chris is part of the architecture residency program which again is a 25 intensive for young professionals and students within the field of art and architecture. And the focus is on critical thinking and design experimentation. So the residency program started just last week, Monday, and I'm very pleased to introduce our residents who are here on the panel, Jessica Martin, Alison Silva, Munjer Hashim, Renan Thoman and Franklin Tzu, who are, who are joining from New York, from Washington, D.C., and from Turkey. So uh, with no further ado, it's, it's great uh, to be in the company of, of Chris and Catherine. Uh, and uh, I just briefly wanted to introduce that uh, they're the co-principals of the experimental design practice, NUMA Studio. And their discussion today will revolve around the theme of ambiguous territory. So NUMA Studio um, is an exchange between architecture and landscape architectural design and it, with an interest in geology and ecological considerations. And Catherine's expertise in landscape architecture, philosophy, geology. She's an associate professor at Pratt Institute School of Architecture, while Chris, architecture and architecture theory is an associate professor and associate dean at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute School of Architecture. So with no further ado, I'll pass on the microphone to Chris and Catherine. The structure for this lecture is uh, approximately 45 minutes of the presentation, followed by a Q&A for about 15 minutes, so no more than an hour. And we welcome our audience to ask questions throughout the presentation. If you like, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and you can also use the chat function throughout the presentation. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Chris and Catherine. Uh, thank you, Irini, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and uh, we'd like to also thank um, Susan um, and Cel uh, Celia for helping us through the process and getting everything um, together. Um, we have been longtime um, fans of T-Space. We've recruited our friends to go to T-Space in the summer and 
um, I think you'll see as we talk about our work that we have an investment in um, these kinds of cross-disciplinary things that um, tea space really brings to life in the summertime. Um, so um, just to get into it, uh, we, we see our practice as mentioned as uh, essentially transdisciplinary in nature, and that's um, specifically in respect to art and design. Um, the latter of which, um, from our perspective, includes architecture and landscape architecture. Um, additionally, we have been involved in a number of curatorial projects, including a recent exhibition alongside a related symposia of, of thinkers across fields. And we see that um, as a really important part of our creative output. And so this is a part of what we'll be talking about today. And that was the ambiguous territory uh, referred to by Arini. <clears throat> so um, just as a, we have a few precedents we're going to look at that <clears throat> hopefully provide a bit of context for our work, but this kind of work in general. Uh, precedents for, for a transdisciplinary practice such as ours, uh, specifically between art, architecture, and landscape, um, are abundant and include the work of site. Uh, in addition to producing new forms of exchange between these three disciplines, um, that is art, architecture, and landscape. Site's approach to representation can also be seen as transitional nature. Uh, it's one that moves between the more figural artist drawing or what we might think of as the more figural artist drawing uh, for which James Wines, who is one of the principles of site, is one of the principles of site, they're still active, uh, is very well known. Um, and the more abstract architectural model, or in this case, in this particular image, uh, a model at once abstract and figural. Uh, abstract in the lack of material specificity, yet figural in terms of the articulation of literal form. So here there's, a, there's an ambiguity that's at work in the work, but also the representation of the work. Another important uh, precedent for us includes land art. Um, and specifically here, we're showing an image of Robert Smithson's Spiral Jetty, which is probably the most recognizable land art, but we're also interested in the work of Mary Miss um, and some others that you guys may be familiar with, um, all of whom really challenge traditional disciplinary boundaries by moving sculpture outside of the gallery and into the physical environment in such a way that it, it really begins to function simultaneously as a cultural entity at the same time it functions as an environmental one. So it, at once it's really a part of its natural context and apart from it. So there is um, still a distinction, right? We're not interested in this idea of like disappearing into the natural. Um, additionally, land artists like Smithson uh, were among the first to begin raising awareness about the environment from, from this kind of conceptual art perspective and our relationship to it. Uh, Spiral Jetty, as uh, it exists now is has this ambiguous status that sits at the same time as a cultural and environmental entity and to that extent it raises broader philosophical questions about traditional distinctions between nature and culture and these are the the kinds of questions that um, really feed into the work that we're doing <clears throat> so that that takes us to 1970 uh, one can, can look even further back into history for similar transdisciplinary conditions. Uh, in this case, as far back as the 16th century with Villa d'Este, uh, which is in Tivoli, just outside of Rome, uh, which we had uh, the great fortune of visiting a few years ago, Catherine organized for us, I should say curated, uh, a fantastic tour of 16th century gardens and villas around Rome, this being one of them, and it was a pretty pretty spectacular um, uh, tour. Um, uh, in, in the case of Villa d'Este, um, this is, we could say, one particular instance within the vast gardens that are on display there. It's a, it's a very large site, um, specifically of sculpture, landscape, as well as water infrastructure, uh, which, unlike the abstract symbolism uh, of Smithson's jetty, uh, in terms of the formal kind of iconography of the spiral itself. Uh, in this case, uh, a form that, that deploys a figural language uh, as well as experiential narrative that further blurs the distinction between human-made and natural. 
uh, partic particularly in its present eroded and encrusted condition. Um, and I would say figural, we were looking at this the other day and going through the presentation, figural in terms of a kind of what we might think of as a kind of uh, a natural form. It obviously has this kind of rock-like quality that's quite literal in its rock likeness, but it also takes on a kind of figural quality that begins to uh, resemble a human head, or at least this is something that we're seeing in it, uh, a kind of what appears to be a kind of eye formation in the upper right hand corner, the central area where the water is being distributed takes on kind of almost the quality of a nose. Uh, and so suddenly the whole thing starts to appear as a kind of head. Um, so there's a lot, there are a lot of interesting associations and conditions that one can read into it that further uh, the ambiguity. I would yes. add that this is probably the least photographed part of Villa d'Este. If you start looking at, um, and reading about it, and the hyper-rationalization of the navigation of a hillside through a series of ramps is um, you know, one of the, the popular images. And this here is the reward at the end of all of that, mm -hmm. um, at the end of the garden, which is quite a uh, narrative and structure. So um, this is a key reading for anyone who's interested in these topics and the, the beginnings of a, a, a very conceptual uh, and, and kind of philosophical framework for land art, for practices that don't obey the disciplinary conditions of um, the kind of disciplinary, um, which is something we'll get into in a little bit. Um, and, you know, if you, if you read the piece, you have to read it like three times. It, it can be quite arcane, um, but nevertheless, it, it's worth wrestling with a bit um, to really get at this, the inherent disciplinary ambiguity of land art itself. Um, in explaining this diagram, I'm going to read a quote from Rosalind Krauss. She says, the dimensions of this structure may be analyzed as follows. There are two relationships of pure contradiction, which are termed axes and are designated by the solid arrows. There are two relationships of contradiction expressed as involution, which are called schemas and are designated by double arrows. And she goes on um, from there, but we're particularly interested, I would say, in those double arrows. Um, she goes on to say, there is no reason not to imagine an opposite term, one that would be both landscape and architecture, which within this schema is called the complex. But to think the complex is to admit into the realm of art two terms that had formerly been prohibited from it, landscape and architecture. So we take this particular uh, quote here as like uh, an entry point um, into Newman Studios um, kind of movement into this expanded field of art, architecture and landscape and uh, embrace this idea of designing for the complex uh, using ecologies, climates, and habitations, both micro and macro, and, and geology, obviously, as uh, Irini mentioned at the, at the outset, which I really appreciate. So in this sense, um, Noom Studio's work is crossing these disciplinary demarcations through this practice of what um, Krauss calls exclusions, such as not landscape or not architecture, um, some of you may also be familiar with Smithson's formulation of the non-site. It's absolutely related to these kinds of dialectic configurations as a way of thinking through what something is by thinking about what it is not. And they serve as a form of critical inquiry by asking such questions as, what is the expanded field of architecture, of sculpture, and of landscape? So <clears throat> the first project we wanted to show is a curatorial project. Uh, invested in precisely these questions and issues called ambiguous territory, architecture, landscape, and the post-natural, Catherine mentioned this previously. Um, the exhibition was first staged at the University of Michigan's College of Architecture in 2017, alongside a symposium, before traveling to the University of Virginia School of Architecture in 2018, the Pratt Manhattan Gallery in 2018 and 2019, and most recently, the Handworker Gallery at Ithaca College in 2019. 2020. Currently, and currently we're in the process of organizing <clears throat> both the exhibition and symposium content into a book to be published by ACTAR. So um, the exhibition was co-curated and co-organized with our colleagues David Solomon and Kathy Belikov 
um, the idea emerged um, quite organically, um, no pun intended, um, from a conference uh, that we all participated in in Seattle in 2015. Um, and this discussion around uh, questions related to transdisciplinary practice emerged among the four of us and specifically the ways in which such practice might offer new ways to think about our current environmental crisis. Um, and in this sense, uh, the ambiguous territory relates to two forms of territory. One is literal, the territory of matter, the stuff of earth itself, and the other is, fig is figural, the territory of disciplinarity. So in this sense, we were interested in gathering work from the disciplines of art, architecture, and landscape architecture, but more specifically work that in various ways challenges traditional boundaries between these disciplines, as well as what we might come to think of as artificial or natural. We enjoy things that really confound those boundaries. And in this sense, the concept of the post-natural was also employed to think about material as well as visual and even oral conditions that defy either state and instead to borrow terminology from Krauss, um, occupy a state of neither nor, whether related to disciplinary status or material definition. And in the spirit of one of these oppositions, Krauss says, whatever the medium employed, the possibility explored in this category is a process of mapping the axiomatic features of the architectural experience, the abstract conditions of openness and closure onto the reality of a given space. <clears throat> Further, and also similar to Krauss's conception of a practice of negativity, we were interested in work that was less about proposing solutions to the problem of climate change and more about raising critical questions about it, and as a result, promoting new forms of consciousness. And I think here, uh, there's, I think, a very clear connection to the theme for the residency at T-Space this year, which is a consciousness pavilion, <clears throat> uh, which sounds quite interesting. Uh, in this respect, if there is an inherent function to the work we selected, and by extension, the exhibition itself, it was less about operating on the world and more about operating on the way we perceive and ultimately come to understand the world. In other words, its primary territory of operation was that of cognition. I think this is a term that also comes up in the, in the brief, uh, something we've been very interested in, um, albeit through the senses. We were interested in work that asks us to think in new and different ways as a means of coming to terms with a new and different world under threat due to climate change as well as other global crises. Um, <clears throat> the exhibition includes close to 50 works, and this is again across artists, architects, landscape architects, in some cases artists, architects, and landscape architects that are venturing into other, the other a different discipline or working with someone from another discipline, so in the form of collaborations. Um, and those 50 works were organized into three categories, uh, which you can see here, the, what we started to call the atmospheric, the biologic, and the geologic. While literal in one respect, and that each category obviously refers to a physical portion of our environment, we also conceive these categories in abstract terms, specifically the material, formal, spatial, and in some cases, oral qualities and characteristics of the work, each of which challenge the senses in new in different ways. So here we're looking at two um, panorama photographs of the exhibition staged um, at the Pratt Manhattan Gallery in 2018, 2019, and the University of Michigan um, in 2017. Um, the, the, the show, uh, in a sense, was, had a bit of a snowballing effect because we did pick up certain projects as it moved from place to place. Um, and it generated quite a bit of interest, so it kept uh, traveling. So, in terms of the format and design of the exhibition, we were interested in revisiting the salon format that flourished in Europe during the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, you might ask why this time period? Uh, what, is, what is the relevance really? Um, and it, it's pretty specific for us. It was um, the location of the origin point of what most believe to be the current geologic era in which we live, which I'm sure you're all familiar with this term, Anthropocene. Um, it's still being decided by the geologists um, who make the ultimate call, but most of them are in agreement at this point that we are in a new geologic uh, period and that it, it was instigated during this time period. So this time period also is contemporaneous with the invention of the steam engine, 
um, which is part of the reason why we uh, placed the beginning of the Anthropocene there, because it was the initiation of wholesale transformation of the globe through human uh, activity, specifically of a technological variety. So the, the salon, we're also interested in as a space for discourse. Um, and as mentioned, the exhibition really aspired to be that um, and to spur uh, these kinds of conversations, as well as the salon's traditional format of hanging pictures and loose groupings and in such a way to promote new affiliations and association between works. So we thought we'd take you through each section briefly by showing just a few examples of work. Uh, this is a photo of the atmospheric section. Weatherfield is an interdisciplinary project by the architecture practice lateral office, working in collaboration with the landscape architecture practice, LCLA. Highly atmospheric in its effect, the project deploys what they call a parakite or air-based energy generator as part of a general strategy to transform decommissioned oil fields into new landscapes for public use. An energy park is much about generating renewa renewable energy as visualizing the intimate dance between wind and technology that produces it. Um, this is a work by Ursula Beeman called Subatlantic, which appeals simultaneously to the various meanings of the term subatlantic, a climatic phase beginning 2,500 years ago, as well as the submerged regions of the Atlantic. Visual artist Ursula Beeman immerses her camera deep in oceanic waters to ponder the entanglements of geological time without a human history. Part of their third nature series of architectural proposals intended less for the prosaic and more for the, for the poetic aspects of life as well as architecture. Uh, this project by the architecture practice amid Cerro 9 it envisions architecture not as a singular object, but rather as an environment in itself, one comprised of both built and unbuilt elements, including topiary ponds, small scale dwellings, and a loosely threaded canopy structure anchored to rock formations. <laughs> um, so we're gonna move into um, the biologic uh, section and you see how this was organized. Um, and this is the first photo of that section. Um, Whereas the atmospheric section was comprised only of work on the wall, both the biologic and geologic sections also included physical objects displayed on the floor, as you can see here. This photo also includes the second portion of the biologic section in the middle and to the right. So this project, um, The Birds and the Bees by At um, Harrison Atelier, um, was included in the show. And this was also exhibited locally at CR10. Um, and it's part of a series of speculative building projects um, by Harrison Atelier that explores human and non-human species collaboration. In this case, through the development of an architectural cladding system designed to allow for bird inhabitation while also fulfilling its more traditional function as building enclosure. Additionally, the aesthetic characteristics of the panels are suggestive of topography, implying that the building envelope has been reconceived as a small scale vertical landscape in functional as well as visual terms. American <clears throat> conceptual artist Mark Dion investigates the distinction between scientific methods and subjective influences between fact and fiction, science and art, natural and artificial. Interested in the ways politics and ideology shape our understanding of knowledge, the artist visually displays systems of information and classification while appropriating or imitating scientific or historical methods of collecting, ordering, and exhibiting objects. Um, this is a project by Michael Geffel called Field Dynamics, Editing the Domestic Wild. Um, it was, I will say, in the, in, when we were curating, it was hard for us to find landscape architects who were working in a very experimental fashion, um, much more tradition of architectural practice. Um, and there's obviously a huge opportunity there. Um, so something to consider. This was our great find, Michael Geffel. Um, I just started reading You're a book by, by one of his uh, professors, Julian Raxworthy, also very interesting. Um, recommend checking him out. So Geffel um, uses the Zamboni mowing pattern and um, he is a landscape architect. And this is his um, 
real uh, his method for operating on an existing landscape for this project in such a way that portions of it remain wild, evolving based in the biological dispersal of native, naturalized, and invasive plants that are intentionally left alone, while other portions are domesticated through the various mowing parameters of the machine and its operator. Um, we're moving into the geologic section. So this is a photo of the geologic section. And then uh, you can see uh, right here, probably familiar to all of you, uh, Bertinsky. Um, lots of interesting work on cognition and, and the experience of Bertinsky's photographs. If people are interested in that, we've done some research there and have some good things to read. So Edward Bertinsky's photographs, which operate somewhere between photojournalism and fine art photography, have become increasingly abstract over the years, and as a result, might be seen as at once figural and abstract, with associations to painting as well as photography. Uh, his salt pan series, which this uh, piece comes from, continues in this direction by exploring the subtle modulations of tone and compositional balance of pans as well as the calligraphic tracks produced by vehicles that serve to reference the scale of human intervention. In this respect, Bertinsky's images encapsulate the delicate balance between natural and human processes, the presence of salt in the earth's composition, as well as our need to harness it. <clears throat> Landscape architect Bradley Cantrell's research looks at ways to simulate the complex <clears throat> environmental and geological processes associated with hydrological infrastructure coastal land engineering in response to sea level rise and other large scale forms of human intervention on the earth. Uh, as you can see here, it's an interesting image. It's a hybrid of information. Um, he basically brings together different types of machinery, sensing systems, computing systems, and material systems to develop this kind of physical, I'd say kind of a hybrid physical virtual or physical digital simulator. A uh, formless finder may be familiar to some of you. Um, and in this particular piece called Load Test, um, the architecture practice blurs architecture and landscape in the generation of what might be characterized as a landform in which piles of raw matter replace columns. And the age old drama between architecture and gravity is restaged in this kind of ambiguous equilibrium. <clears throat> So, uh, so that's a sense of the exhibition, which, which has, that's been kind of our primary area of focus for the last few years. Um, but at the same time, we've been involved in a number of other projects related to our own art and design work and wanted to show just a few. Um, just I just one last oh, yeah, word yeah. On, the, um, on the exhibition. So the book was uh, meant to be uh, ready by now, basically, uh, because of coronavirus. It is not, but there's a lot of, uh, writing that was commissioned specifically for the book and we're really excited about it. So the book will include the, all of the works that were in the show as well as um, quite a bit of new theoretical material on these works. So moving into this project, <clears throat> which was originally developed as part of uh, the Curious Cabinet drawing series, which Catherine developed uh, for an exhibition titled Tomorrow's uh, which was at the Onassis Cultural Center in Athens in 2017. Uh, Tara Sigalata was transformed into a design proposal for the exhibition, more recent exhibition, Collapse, at the Gallatin Leibowitz Gallery at NYU in 2018. So this is the, the original Tara Sigalata drawing, which went through um, several different iterations from here. Um, but it was really initially envisioned as a speculative hybrid ecology developed from diverse source material ranging from Renaissance painting to 18th century botanical drawings and herbariums. Um, in this respect, um, the drawing sets its gaze on the past as well as the future through an exploration of a teeming, delicate, impossible, and fractious ecosystem and ambiguous conditions situated in the strange and the familiar human and non-human natural and unnatural. The micro and macro scales here are involuted as are the privileges of each. Um, and it's important to note that the base form of the drawing was actually um, a, uh, an 18th century medical drawing of a kidney stone. 
which is itself a, a form of human geology. So we're talking about the calcium carbonate depositions that are happening within the, the human body. And we're very interested in that scale relating back to the building scale and the materiality of architecture. So uh, this is just a catalog of, of some of the details from the original drawing, many of which were um, hybrids themselves, um, also including paleontological material in addition to the micro uh, and biological material. I don't know if I mentioned that. <clears throat> so this is an elevation drawing of a design proposal that, as I mentioned, came out of Catherine's drawing for the collapse exhibition. Um, which suggests an object situated somewhere between architecture, landscape, and painting. Um, the drawings of various figural and scalar effects and involutions produce an ecological uncanny, or what we've come to, to think of as an ecological uncanny, a version of the uncanny, obviously. It serves to defamiliarize the natural from the artificial, the indoors from the outdoors, and the traditional conception of dwelling from the world external to it. These Krausian oppositions also include geology not geology. In addition to this interest in defamiliarization at the scale of programmatic use, the project also explores the effects of the uncanny at the scale of representation, whereby an architectural roof plan, landscape site plan, and painting serve to blur each other's respective conventions and effects. So this is another project um, which we actually initially developed uh, as part of a residency we did at the McDowell Colony in 2013 um, and emerged from a general interest in the architectural folly as a building type inherently situated between the disciplines of art, architecture, and landscape. Certainly belongs to both the histories of architecture and landscape architecture, uh, but also ventures into the space of art in terms of its primary programmatic function having to do with meaning. Uh, it was first exhibited for the group exi exhibition Potential Fields, um, which was organized and sponsored by CR10 Arts at the Claremont State Historic Site in Claremont, New York. Uh, and then the project was later presented at a conference at Syracuse University, University and published in its proceedings. Um, so you're looking at a montage here. Um, and we'd like to uh, reference architectural historian Anthony Vidler on the folly who wrote that as a vehicle of all sorts of fashionable literary notions from the sublime to the picturesque, the folly exhibited them in a kind of museum of meditative objects, which we're very interested in that. And I think it's, um, it, it, yet again, we, uh, it relates when we try to pick uh, what we're showing you here based on the, the theme of the residency and this idea of consciousness uh, is something that we're seriously invested in um, as we've been talking about. But um, whether you deploy something like this at the, the garden at Airman Unville, which is a, a, an important uh, folly garden in the late 18th century or at Parc de La Valette 200 years later, dealing with deconstruction in architectural thinking um, the Folly provides a unique space for experimentation and theoretical inquiry, um, the purpose of which is largely to question the purpose of art and design itself. And you, can, you could say the same for many land art projects as well. The Alice Acock, for example, at mm. uh, Architecture Online. Mm. <clears throat> so one proposed site for underground, uh, which we proposed as, or at least we're thinking of as an architectural folly for the uh, Anthropocene age, was the peripheral edge of a typical sculpture, sculpture park like Omai, uh, which is in Ghent, New York, near where we are in Hudson. Um, an inherently ambiguous condition belonging neither exclusively to nature nor culture. As such, this edge condition necessarily serves as a zone of exchange between human and non-human forms of habitation and meaning, for which the folly provides a space of intensification as simultaneously a cultural object located within the sculpture park space of display in a natural object slash environment, because it works as an environment in terms of the, the non-human forms of life it supports, um, and does so both visually and ecologically uh, in being linked to the tree line. So this is an axonometric drawing of the folly, which depicts the project's principal formal gesture, um, which is a large section of earth, along with its various non-human inhabitants displaced from the ground. 
in turn, this formal and material displacement serves to displace the conventions of human non human relations. The ecology diagram to the right illustrates human as well as non human forms of inhabitation that the folly supports. It's the latter of which includes vegetation, insects, and wildlife, um, mushrooms, all manner of spiders, etc. Um, the service uh, and the, the volumetric mass supports the pawpaw tree, Asaminia triloba, which is uh, a fruit tree that's actually native to North America, despite the fact that it looks like a tropical, right? It, it's actually related to the tropical papaya. Um, it's not widely distributed due to a recent, geologically speaking, 10,000 years ago, uh, quaternary extinction event. Um, but ecologists have been Repropagating the pawpaw because it's clonally growing root systems, buttress stream bed edges, and its fruit was an exotic bounty favored by Thomas Jefferson, among others in the 18th century, who were cultivating it specifically for the tastiness of the fruit. <laughs> <clears throat> so these axonometric diagrams depict the following uh, the first, the project's principal formal gesture which is a large section of earth displaced from below to above the ground plane. Uh, the second, the Follies nine square columnar structure made out of gabion, the Follies formal system provides two types of enclosure. One for non-humans, the interior volume of each column, and one for humans, a second interstitial interior located in between the columns, which is produced by inflecting the column geometry. And third, ecotones and biomes, an ecotone is a transition zone between two biomes. It is where two communities meet and integrate, a transitional area that typically sponsors great species diversity and population uh, than its adjacent biomes. So this was um, an, a, a physical model, a scale model of the folly that we installed at Claremont Historic Site for a group exhibition called Potential Fields. It's comprised of 3D prints, um, modified uh, dis dismembered uh, plastic aquarium plants, aquarium pebbles, floral wire. There's some lead children's toys in there. There's a, there's a number of items um, that went into producing that model. Need needless to say, we had a lot of fun making this oh, thing. <laughs> yes, we did. And we, we laughed quite a bit. Yeah, if we're having fun, we, 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 we just keep, we go with it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, the, the measure of success is whether or not we're having fun For and sure. laughing. Yeah. Okay, so um, we're going to show this as uh, very much in the in the zone of what we're talking about here. This is a drawing that we did for a storefront exhibition, and it's called Not Out There. This was commissioned by Storefront for Art and Architecture in New York as part of the Measure Group exhibition, which featured 30 drawings by 30 international architects in 2015. So um, architect Stephen Hull and artist Vito Acconci's design for the storefront for art and architecture famously negotiates an inherently ambiguous boundary between the interior and exterior, private and public, as well as cultural and civic spaces of the city. Our speculative redrawing of their design reimagines this negotiation between increasingly ambiguous human, non-human agents and boundaries. New Studio here reimagines the takeover of this culturally important corner of Lower Manhattan with a cast of species that once occupied this very spot in the early 17th century, as documented in the data of the Manahatta project. I highly recommend checking out Manahatta if you have not. Cast into the uncertain future of the 21st century metropolis in which the physical as well as philosophical boundaries were already eroding under pressure from the signals and the noise of climate change, storefront is reconceived as a not out there, no longer exclusive to human culture. So here are just a few details of the drawing. Um, we still have 10 minutes, I think. Um, which like a lot of our projects, I guess maybe just a word on representation bring together, and we mentioned this at the outset in reference to the site forest building project, uh, tend to mix media. Uh, in this case, we um, developed a computer model, three-dimensional computer model of storefront, which generated the, um, the orthogonal drawing just as line work, and then brought it into Photoshop, 
uh, to do all of the vegetation and textures. Uh, the catalog obviously is, is a series of images. And again, as Catherine mentioned, these are actual species that inhabited this portion of Manhattan um, in the 17th century. Um, so in terms of representation, um, you know, particular to this, just as one example, we're, we're very much interested in a kind of another scale of ambiguity that looks at the ways in which um, certain representational conventions from one discipline might migrate into the other and vice versa. Um, when I was in architecture school, uh, you know, things, things were pretty much entirely driven by computer work, uh, specifically modeling, 3D modeling. When Catherine was in landscape architecture school, a lot of the drawings that she did, large sections, um, landscape sections, plans, et cetera, used Photoshop very extensively in terms of how they would visualize vegetation. So in this case, we're bringing together two kind of predominant conventions of representation, one that belongs principally to architecture, which is 3D modeling, kind of orthogonal drawing, and the other landscape architecture, the use of Photoshop, and a kind of collage, almost painterly collage technique uh, approach towards vegetation. And this is a photograph of the, of the show, not taken by us, but our drawing ended up right on the right side there, if you can see it, so frames the view. Um, and it made the New York Times. <laughs> and it made the New York Times. There was a write-up of the show and a few mentions, and they, I, I don't remember who wrote the piece, but they, they found our strange drawing interesting, interestingly strange, so we did get a mention of that. So um, we're, this is uh, literally something that was pulled out of the oven um, just so you can see a little bit of work process. Um, it's something we've been working on for um, a, a little bit, um, which is uh, we started this drawing series by calling it the Shaggy Axo. And I bring the Shaggy, he brings the Axo typically. <laughs> and this is like, it's so fundamental to our working method. It was one of these things that we came up with that. It was like, okay, let's go with it. And, um, you know, just a note on, on what that might mean, because there, there is a philosophical underpinning to what shagginess might mean. And, and um, a lot of this comes also from the 18th century, which we talked about at the outset. What I didn't mention, it was also the onset of picturesque as a movement, as an aesthetic movement, it had very much to do with cognition and a relationship of humans to the environment. It was also a point in time where obviously we started with the steam engine and, and, and global scale uh, industrialization was kicking off. It certainly didn't start globally, but um, there was a sense of, of loss already happening around the, the kind of ideals of pure nature, um, which was part of the instigating force for this whole aesthetic category to develop, which was really actually developed in salons with people arguing and talking about what is the picturesque, what are the values, and, and if you line them up with the beautiful, they're quite opposite, right? So on the one hand, you have, you have parallel and symmetry, which is beautiful. And in the, uh, the universe of the picturesque, um, the value is asymmetry, irregularity, variety. In, in the beautiful, you have smoothness, you have youth. In the picturesque, you have age and erosion as values, right? And, and it's very much about observing the uh, activities of nature on the world. So one of the kind of ways in uh, for us also, we talked about the folly, but we like um, exploring typologies that are um, the meeting point of architecture and landscape as ways for us to work. So it, it works on multiple scales in terms of drawing techniques themselves, um, but also the form. So the Hortus Conclusus, the enclosed garden um, in a book that was pretty recently written by Christophe Giraud. I also recommend this as a kind of, if you're looking for a landscape um, compendium that really gets at the, the history of landscape architecture from the very get-go. He puts the world of landscape into two categories, one of which is, is a clearing in a forest, and the other is the hortus conclusus. And he basically makes an argument at the start of the book that everything that can be considered landscape architecture is one of those two categories. It's a pretty bold, um, and, and it, it makes some sense, you know, there's a, there's a lot to it. Um, he's at the Eteha in Zurich, incredibly interesting person who's written quite a bit on topology, um, an obsession with point clouds and landscape architecture. So there's also a 
a strong kind of technological component to his work and thinking. So this drawing is um, something that we were experimenting with a kind of combination of both hand drawing and uh, you know axonometric drawings and it's the beginning of a series of how we might think about the hortus conclusus and some typical kinds of uh, typological elements from landscape architecture and in this case specifically the alley so we uh, in this drawing we see 10 trees in two rows it's obviously exploded um, Part of um, our interest in the kind of holistic relationship of everything is that what is underneath the ground plane um, is of, of deep and abiding interest. And what we're beginning to draw here, and, and this drawing uh, kind of begs to be zoomed in on, but we won't do that, is a, a, a very intricate fungal layer. Um, so we like getting into a, a, a very high level of resolution to think about the micro and macro environments as they're Kind of working together but on a, a more conceptual level thinking about what it would mean to have a screen with a panoramic landscape view and is it a screen of a colonnade or is this attached to an actual colonnade is it a tree or is it a column you know these are some of the fundamental questions that we're probing with this kind of work and it does um, in terms of a, a, a relation and how we can um, kind of bring it back, uh, Julian Raxworthy, who's a, a landscape uh, historian and theorist, talked about, um, he's actually quoting Gottfried Semper and saying that the architect's first inclination is to demarcate space, right? And we can think of that as territory as well. We were talking about ambiguous territory previously, but that is his kind of lead in to thinking about the hortus conclusus and how it might um, become an operand in a design process. Yeah, I would say that, that also in a way similar to <clears throat> our interest in the architectural folly, the alley um, interestingly belongs both to the history of landscape architecture and architecture to the extent that the alley, as Catherine has just mentioned, uh, is a kind of colonnade, a colonnade with trees. Uh, and deploys a kind of geometric regularity that one associ associates with architecture uh, and produces a room. Um, um, so in a way, it's, it's, it's another type, I guess we could think of as a kind of historical type that is already like the folly, is already situated in a kind of transdisciplinary space. Um, and to that extent belongs to history, but then becomes something to for us at least of interest to work on in terms of, of thinking about its relevance today. In other words, how does one take a traditional or historical type and rethink it in a contemporary context um, in terms of its various traits and its characteristics, but also its various meaning systems. Um, and then I should say that it's also quite literally close to home, uh, literally and figuratively close to home because we're, we're building one in our backyard um, uh, we were talking about hole digging earlier, which I've been becoming a, a, something of an expert on, but um, we currently have an alley and we live in Hudson in our backyard of 16 trees, um, which is under development for the last couple of years now. And as I mentioned in our conversation at the outset, or I guess it was with reference to Villa Deste when we <clears throat> did that tour of 16th century gardens and villas around Rome. I think it was very, certainly on Catherine, I think very inspirational in terms of an interest in, in these traditional formal gardens and how one might think of them in a contemporary context. We, we transitioned from a super wild meadow condition of all native plants um, into this. So the, in terms of the spectrum of formal, aformal and landscape architectural design, like really opposite ends of the poles. Um, however, the ideas of, of native plantings are, are ser of serious interest to us. And the trees themselves are Carpinus Caroliniana, which is um, baby beech or ironwood. And um, the, it's the stuff that wizard spears are made of. So Gandalf is walking around with a, 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 an ironwood, undoubtedly, and also very slow growing. So patience is, is uh, part of the plan with landscape. So that's, um, that brings us to our final slide. And according to my clock, that was exactly 45 minutes. So <laughs> here's the timer. <laughs>
Uh, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine and Chris. Um, very beautiful material. I would like to welcome um, our audience, all of the 45 people who are participating right now to use the Q&A to ask questions. And also I would like to hear from the residents. I'm sure there are questions about the work. Um, and if I may start, I, you mentioned Chris also that you know, you're using uh, your place and uh, your backyard as a space for experimentation. I was wondering how you know, commuting maybe back and forth into the city or the, from Hudson to New York City, do you think that affects the way you see or the way you think about things like coming in and out of um, the metropolis in a way? Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. I mean, that's, <clears throat> that brings up a whole conversation that we've been having for a number of years now um, also with Stan Allen, who I know is giving a talk later in the series and who we've known for many years, who's interested in a kind of certain ambiguity between the rural and the urban. A lot of his work is navigating that in terms of his residential work in the Hudson Valley. But, and it's something very much of, of interest to Catherine, who um, among other things is on the board at Basilica Arts, which is in Hudson. Um, also a transdisciplinary arts organization uh, and is currently looking at a number of developments that start to move into this territory. But it's been in a kind of space of, of what we've been, well, others refer to as the micro city or an idea of, of small urbanism with cities like Hudson, which on the one hand are urban. They have all the kind of basic characteristics of a city in terms of culture, economy, a kind of density of fabric, street life, et cetera but at a very small scale. So it's almost, and it kind of feels when we first moved here, it's kind of felt like a little chunk of Brooklyn that had been airlifted to the Hudson Valley. But then you get in the car and you're five minutes to a dairy farm buying raw milk. And so there's a very interesting convergence of the urban and the rural, again, something that Stan's also interested in. And he brought to our attention recently a book that we haven't uh, gotten into yet, but called Nature's Metropolis, which mm -hmm. is a story of Chicago uh, sounds super interesting, a kind mm -hmm. of more complex reading of, of the relationship between the city and its, and its, uh, its kind of rural periphery. Um, so yeah, I think in terms of the alley, I mean, if that's kind of the, where your question was, I mean, Catherine, we both commute to the city, Catherine more so than I, um, and then I also commute up to Troy. So we're, we're in Hudson, we're in the Hudson Valley, but we're also in and out of cities. So we are kind of between, between the urban and the rural, quite literally. And I think, yeah, I think both in terms of our interests as well as our experience, that is very much kind of shaping the work. Um, yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, I would just add that the, the micro city um, idea, we, we did do some research on that. Um, I taught a studio that I hope to teach again um, this fall that was looking at the, the conditions of the micro city um, and the, the the interest now is looking at the waterfronts of Hudson, and that's also part of um, the work that I'm involved with, uh, with Basilica in terms of their net zero campus. And there's some really, really radical and realizable ideas afoot there about um, basically um, an idea of an environment that doesn't produce waste. So food trucks that are running on fuel that was produced from food scraps, for example. And that's actually happening right now. And they're really, you know, working very hard to bring these ideas into, you know, off the, the, the page of drawing and into reality. And there is so much territory there that is not uh, already uh, circumscribed with historic preservation fabric, uh, which is an issue in terms of the, the city itself of Hudson, right? It's not something that's going to um, accept new design thinking very easily, but the waterfront, absolutely, um, because of the kind of rawness of the condition that it's in. And then uh, in terms of the research about microcity, one of the kind of interesting facts that we uncovered is that the census, it's a newly, it's a newly counted um, group in this country, it used to just be urban and rural, and now we have micro, they call it micropolitan. We like microcity better just because we're architects, and, you know. Um, but um, the, the census has documented that it will be um, the highest percentage of growth will occur in these microcities across the country. Doesn't mean highest number of people overall, but 
highest percentage of growth. And given the coronavirus um, and the ideas of density that we're now questioning, um, my guess is that that will uh, continue apace. There are a couple of questions from the audience that we can take. Uh, in the meantime, I, I was wondering, how do you um, observe um, the sh a shift of interest perhaps over the years, throughout the years of your practice, um, as you know, the, the, the general public becomes more aware of climate crisis and um, do you notice a shift in how these two fields or landscape, landscape architecture, the city um, and nature and our awareness about those issues come together? How, how do you see this over the years transforming perhaps? Or is it? Um, yeah, I, I do think that it's transforming. I think, um, you know, the ideas of landscape urbanism were in a sense um, foundational to get people thinking about parcels of land that were, you know, quite peripheral, unbeautiful, things like pavement, right? What are the human layer is in the world um, came really came through that discourse. What didn't come through that discourse was a lot of design work, frankly. Um, but it led to ecological urbanism as a discussion. And I feel that that has been a launching point to um, really strip out um, things like agricultural production within an urban environment, which, you know, in a place like Hudson, there isn't really, like you can't have chickens in your backyard in Hudson because, you know, you just have to go a mile and you can have 50 chickens and not bother anybody, but you can have chickens in Brooklyn, right? Or I don't know if they change that, but, you know, there's a necessity issue there, which I think is very interesting, but there's also embedded in a lot of this stuff is a return to things that, were um, pretty standard, even in an urban environment. And we learned that the uh, typical 19th century family in New York City would have a cow, and that was their a food source. So they would keep a family cow to have milk um, for the family. And so they would be in a deeply embedded urban condition, but keeping a cow and probably a small vegetable garden and this kind of thing. So. In a weird way, I think a lot of what's happening now with these hybrids is that we're returning to earlier ideas of food production, proximity of food production to habitation. And it can really have a dramatic impact on how we live in cities. Yeah, I would, <clears throat> I would say just to add to that, I think what, what I've noticed, what we've noticed, certainly in the last, you know, I don't know, five, five, five to 10 years, five to eight years, somewhere in there, uh, certainly is, is how these issues have entered the academy. I mean, we, our practice uh, and our, our work and our careers are kind of situated between academia and art and design work and curatorial work. And I think certainly if I go back to when I was a grad student, um, you know, which was in the 90s, um, you know, there was a lot of interest in theoretical discourse um, as it related to architecture. None of that had to do with environmental issues or very little, at least within, let's say, East Coast kind of establishment. Uh, I think in part because people who were talking about environmental issues were principally talking about it in terms of a kind of problem, problem solving approach, which we, you know, the obvious reference for that is sustainability, which is kind of, okay, we have a problem, we need to deploy architecture to solve that problem. And I think what, what we've certainly noticed, and I think a lot of people have noticed in, uh, in recent years is that, it, that the issue, I mean, first of all, it's, you can't ignore the issue. I mean, the issue is so big and so critical that it really can't be ignored. And I think it's, it took a while, but it finally entered uh, a kind of discursive space, uh, the academy, um, through theory and through kind of critical thinking as well as creative work. Um, in terms of not necessarily in some cases aspects of problem solving, um, but in ways also that have to do with, I guess, where it picks up, this picks up themes related to the residency at T-Space of uh, ideas of cognition, consciousness, awareness, um, which is to say how might one uh, engage these questions at a kind of theoretical discursive level and then by extension creative level in terms of a lot of the work that we showed, our work as well as work in the exhibition, the Ambiguous Territory exhibition, a lot of that work is deploying aesthetics as a form of visual thinking 
to generate new ways of thinking about the world we live in. The world we live in has gone through some substantial transformations in recent years. And um, in addition to physical transformations, environmental transformations, arguably a kind of philosophical or ideological transformation, or at least we're hoping, or that's, that's, what, what, that's what the need is. And so the question then becomes, okay, well, one, one way to address the climate crisis is sustainability, deploy architecture and its related fields, landscape architecture, et cetera, uh, to, to, to as, a, as a form of kind of practical problem solving. The other way is to think about a different kind of functionality, which would be a functionality of cognition of awareness, the degree to which creative practices um, like architecture, like landscape architecture, like the arts, um, the ways in which they deploy aesthetics, new aesthetic conditions, and this is where the post-natural became important for us, and it's something that's been, for a number of years now, has been floating throughout uh, academia. Uh, a way of rethinking our relationship to what we think of as the natural world and questioning this sort of assumed division or break between what's natural and what's artificial. And so the question then is, okay, are there other spaces for work to take place within these fields, architecture, art, landscape architecture, that aren't limited to going out and problem solving, um, but that have a kind of functionality that has to do with generating awareness and awareness through a process of cognition that is, um, that is, that is induced by the senses or sensory experience, which is relating to, to new and unfamiliar aesthetic conditions. So we mentioned at one point the uncanny, you know, Tony Vidler has a whole book on the architectural un uncanny, which is a fantastic book where he's basically, and he's looking at it in the context of 80s experimental architecture, but he's basically looking at it as a, as a kind of an aesthetic condition that generates inquiry. The uncanny is that which is unfamiliar or something that's semi-familiar but has become defamiliarized. And in becoming defamiliarized promotes inquiry of like, well, what, what is that? Um, so I think that's, that's something that, that we've noticed is increasingly um, an interest um, within these fields uh, of looking at other ways in which one addresses these broader kind of environmental uh, kind of questions. And I would say just to um, kind of follow up on what Chris just said, a specific example from, from Bertinsky, who we were fortunate enough to get. And by the way, he, his office was amazing to work with. He really liked the spirit of the exhibition. And so much of where he's coming from is what Chris is talking about here, which is this idea of awareness raising. And um, some of the cognition pieces that we read are, are cataloging in a very data-oriented way, which is pretty wild. Um, people's response to his photographs. And initially there's, there's that feeling of, of experiencing the sublime where it's, it's, it's absolutely an aesthetically pleasing image that is drawing one in. They're so large that you really enter into the environment of the image. And the scalar effects are, are very unclear until you really start to examine it, right? And then when you start to examine it and you find out that this absolutely gorgeous image is actually a super toxic polluted site, there's a real uh, conflict that happens there um, from a cognition perspective, from an emotional response perspective. Um, and there's, a, there's been quite a bit uh, written about that. It's very intentional, clearly, um, on his part. And it's, in a sense, it's a device about raising awareness about these issues. Um, and, and it's quite interesting to us. If we can take some of the clarifying questions first, maybe um, I'm not sure if you can also see the questions from your end. I will try to read it out loud here. The name, what was the name of the book by the landscape architect um, Clearing the Forest? Oh, Ask Nancy uh, it's the, oh, okay, it's right here. <laughs> the Course of Landscape Architecture, um, it's here. Christophe Giraud. It's a big one. Uh -huh. and the coffee table book, I wouldn't put it in the category of, of um, it's more than a coffee table book. I, it, he's a serious theorist. This is written for a general audience. Um, so it's a little bit of a caveat, but there's an edited book that he did recently um, that's also very interesting and it gets into a wide 
So if you look at Chris Giro, you'll see a lot of the words. It's G-I-R-O-T. Um, and of course, the program, which is an advanced um, landscape program, I'm not sure if it's, I, I know it's, I think it's an MLA degree, but they have multiple degrees at the ATEHA in Zurich where he works. He runs the program. Mm -hmm. um, uh, an, an anonymous attendee is asking, what was the landscape architecture history reference book or author fascinating dichotomy? Landscape architecture history reference book or author? I think that, oh, this might have been, I think that might have been the Christoph Giro, but this was another, um, this is another recent volume. I don't know if you can see that. It's Overgrown by Julian Raxworthy, um, who's also doing some work right now in um, looking at landscape architectural. He's very, he actually criticizes the history that, that Christoph Giro sets out. And the criticism has to do with the fact that, and it's, it's, it's absolutely true, that most of the landscape projects that are documented historically as a key part of the historical timeline are projects that have a significant and legible architectural component. And Julian Raxworthy is looking at um, the, the field of landscape architecture from the very beginning of humans working the planet and suggesting that some of our biggest moves are, are not registered in this way, in terms of we go back to the Fertile Crescent and the first wholesale agricultural practices. And so it's a really, it, it's in the spirit of decolonization of the field of landscape architecture itself. On the one hand, to like pull itself a little bit away from the architectural history in which it's very much embedded, but also to think about things like indigenous practice, um, agricultural practice, as really important inscriptions on the globe uh, that in order to really fully present a history of landscape architecture, we need to understand these things. This book doesn't get into that so much, Overgrown. It's a current area of research uh, that he's working on. You can find a little bit on his website about it. Mm -hmm. um, another person from the audience is asking, hi, great work. My question is, what are your views on the relationship of pandemics led by human and animal trafficking to the making of cities that are symmetrical and so-called beautiful by developers? Uh, what was the last part to make? Uh, it was the relation of the pandemic to the making of cities. Um, what are your views on the relationship of, of pandemics led by human and animal trafficking to the making of cities that are symmetrical and so-called beautiful, in parentheses, led by developers? Oh. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I think that, uh, we, well, we've been talking about this a lot and actually in reference to a specific book um, by Bruno Latour, which is called Down to Earth. It's another recent book that um, I, I, I highly recommend. It's one of the most readable things he's written. And it's, you know, in the sense that how we were talking about Gruczynski as having a real agenda in terms of awareness building with his work, I believe that, and it's just a supposition that Bruno Latour um, really wanted people to read this book. It's slim and it's, it's pretty clear for Bruno. And he's really talking about mass migrations as a characteristic of the world that we live in right now. And uh, for, for us, um, the coronavirus is another example of a form of mass migration that's um, really shifting global balance in a way that is, um, you know, he's, he, the critique is, 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 is really sitting at the door of the 1% in the book. Um, he starts it with a quote from Jared Kushner and the quote is, we have read enough books, which, you know, we know where he's coming from before we even start to read the first page of the volume. Um, but he does also reference the Titanic analogy in terms of um, the kind of 1% actually having a high degree of awareness of the collapse of systems. So I see the pandemic as yet just another migration and another piece of evidence of the collapse that we're all living within. Um, and because I come from a background of geology, it's really, um, and it's something that Chris and I are talking about all the time, um, we understand the idea of 
radical change that actually can happen overnight. You know, vol volcano, um, you know, it doesn't take very long. When it actually explodes, there's there's a radical wholesale shifting of climate that occurs, and and something like this is absolutely underway now. The question is how how quickly it will happen, and you know, with the Titanic analogy, who's getting in the life raft? And so. With, I, I'm curious to see how it will um, begin to take shape in, in cities, especially when you have all these luxury towers that seem to be kind of carpeting New York City right now. And that idea, um, it, it'll be very interesting to see how it shakes out over the coming two years. I mean, I could imagine like reconceiving of those as, as uh, you know, some kind of affordable housing it's it's hard to imagine um that occurring but it it does raise the question of whether new york can even support the density that it currently exhibits yeah i mean i would say it's on on a kind of philosophical level whether it's the pandemic or it's glacial retreat or it's mega droughts in the west or uh you know mega fires in australia all of these things are are kind of raising major questions about the anthropocentric worldview that has dominated at least Western civilization uh, for centuries. Um, you know, this, this kind of idea that we're, we're at the center of the universe and everything is sort of secondary to us. Uh, and a lot of people are writing about this, obviously. Uh, you know, Timothy Morton is someone who's kind of been, you know, very, very vocal and also very prominent in kind of architecture and art circles you know, certainly in terms of his, his concept of the hyper object, which certainly the pandemic is a classic example of the hyper object as is uh, global warming, right? The, the kind of that, that phenomenon that you know exists, but you can't, you can't see or point to because it's so vast. It's so uh, vastly distributed over geographic space uh, and time being temporal in nature. Um, so these are, you know, and as he writes about it, these are, these are kind of the, the these are the signals um, that something something drastic is happening, um, and the the opportunity is that that the effects of these conditions, whether it's the pandemic or it's um, or it's coastal flooding, uh, the opportunity is that it that it it generates a kind of a shock or it generates a kind of uh, a moment of recognition and then a moment of awareness. That um, that maybe our worldview needs to be rethought, uh, which is to say a kind of anthropocentric worldview. So, I mean, there are loads of problems that relate to it, and then questions about the designing of cities. Yeah, on some level, I think you could say a city like New York isn't really sustainable. Or, I mean, this is something certainly I think that Stan was interested in terms of the whole micro city, micropolitan question. You know, the mega city was a kind of was a was a model of urbanism that certainly dominated the second half of the 20th century and the question is you know are these are these models of ur urbanization sustainable i mean clearly not in terms of the resources they consume the population densities etc so it does raise serious questions about the future of urbanism but again on a, maybe on a more philosophical level um in terms of our work and the work some of the work at least that we had in the show uh, this question of, of anthropocentrism is front and center. And uh, on some basic philosophical, ideological level, putting, to, putting into question the assumption that everything is for us. Um, the folly that we designed um, underground was, was about shifting the relationship between the human and the earth. We're used to being on top of the earth. We're used to walking on the ground. We have a relationship to nature it is relatively passive. Um, we wanted to produce a kind of, almost kind of like a grotto condition where suddenly what's underground is above ground and the only space of human occupation is in this new underground, whereby the privileged position of the human on the earth is suddenly displaced to being in the earth or under the earth and exposed to a different kind of earth. Um, and so that, that for us was a way in which if there's a programmatic function to that particular project, it's to raise questions about our relationship to the earth, our assumed position in relationship to the earth, our assumed privilege position or position of privilege. So I think that's certainly something that the pandemic is just yet one other example of, uh, is that the kind of anthropocentric worldview that has driven Western civilization uh, needs to be radically rethought. 
Uh, and then the question is, how do these disciplines, architecture, landscape, architecture, art, how do they engage that? Um, yeah, there is a kind of large scale humbling process that yeah. I feel, um, I don't know, it's something that I, when I, I studied geology in the, the late 80s, early 90s, and um, I was introduced to the idea of climate change then, and all of the geologists were, were, knew it was happening already, and they said, well, the signal before the noise has already been struck, and here's the data. And I remember talking to people about it back then, and they thought I was a conspiracy theorist. Like, no, this is science. <laughs> And um, you know, here we are again, where there's like some strange reversal happening. But even you know, the strongest denier can't um, you know protect themselves effectively against the coronavirus without really listening to the science. So it does feel like there's some sort of karmic reckoning happening, um, and I it, it it makes me feel hopeful in the sense that people who may not have thought about these things, who may not have thought about you know. Uh, what it means to have species collapse and environmental collapse that we we saw in in such a short period of time how quickly a species could take over essentially i mean the idea that a virus could have this kind of effect globally in such a short period of time suggests the power of of ecologies is much greater than the collective power of humans and i just you know we we do feel a little bit of hope there that it could change some some minds and open some minds mm -hmm. yes it's important um I'll, I'll continue with um perhaps these two more questions and i would like to also hear from our residents um if there is any question uh Munher, are you uh you want to ask a question yes Munher yeah um so you know what's interesting with the pandemic is we're essentially craving open space and the and the parks now essentially so moving forward do you see in very dense cities uh, more essentially pseudo landscapes or borrowed landscapes happening or borrowed ecologies kind of like this implantation of landscapes in a place which potentially does not accept that same landscape happening do you have a comment on that do you think that's something that could happen so I, I think actually, um, you know, the idea of public space is becoming a, a very important and interesting question here. And the difference between a public space that has a roof and a public space that has no roof is, is massive right now. And so, you know, we can think of, and even the Hortus Conclusus, um, this, which is a part of our current obsession, um, is an urban framework for something like this. I mean, we could imagine the Hortus Conclusus um, as a roof condition but also its typical use, which is much more common in a kind of Mediterranean climate, which is inside architecture, right? Um, and, and we are, you know, we don't, we don't want to create new conditions where we're going back to the kind of Middle Ages where we have our protected, that was really another important instantiation of the Hortus Conclusus, which is like about keeping the world out, keeping danger out um, by creating an, a garden that's internal to architecture. And I think what you're talking about is more an explosion, right, of landscape uh, relative to architecture and not this kind of intense internality that's, um, that's suggested there. And I, I think there's a ton of room to think about new ways that we can do that. Um, there are, you know, in, in a city like New York, there still are, are places that are not quite um, circumscribed that way. And when I spend, you know, there's a lot of absolutely amazing new public spaces that have been developed from a landscape perspective. But there's certain things that I find interesting that aren't really, you know, New Yorkers don't, there's not many, many park benches. Like there's no place to sit down, you know, so maybe we'll start reconsidering that. I mean, there's a kind of, you know, any spot you can sit has spikes on it. Um, and obviously that's part of a deterrent factor for the homeless, but you know, can't we have a civil society and a place to rest and shade Right, and the other thing too is that if you go to the parks that are at the edges of the city, which are quite beautiful, and lots of people run and bike and do all these kinds of things, it's very much about moving. It's about the promenade, um, and not so much about resting. And I think that there's 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 work to be done in terms of what that might mean, and also agricultural space and and how we begin to think of that, whether it's uh, some kind of hybrid of interior and exterior environments. But I do think that all these kind of um, fragments of the city 
um, could be rethought. It was interesting when, uh, you know, relatively early into the, the pandemic, these photos started showing up on the internet <clears throat> of, of scenes from various cities where obviously being completely void of human occupation, nature was returning in the form of, of wildlife. I mean, I, I read later that some of them were kind of, uh, you know, a little bit misleading, Photoshopped. but <laughs> photoshopped or whatever but nevertheless i mean it was an interesting phenomenon and of course there are those amazing sa the satellite imagery of just the decrease of air pollution in the absence of all the transportation that takes place on a daily basis so it was it was interesting how the pandemic uh exposed um our footprint on the world and and just how how um abrasive it is and I think to that extent, it does raise interesting questions. I mean, when I start to think about its implications for design, you know, there are a number of, of architects, um, one of whom we included in our show, Ariane Marie Harrison, who's a colleague of Catherine's at Pratt, um, her practice, Harrison Atelier. And she's been, she and her husband, Seth, who've done some projects together. Um, but she's been very interested in this this general idea of what it means to design for the non-human. Uh, you know, if the history of architecture is the history of designing for humans, it's it's an anthropocentric discipline. Uh, architecture is for us, whether it's in terms of meaning or kind of prosaic functionality. So this idea that that suddenly you would start to expand. Uh, the, the, the scope of architectural design to include things other than us. I mean, the way, obviously, landscape architecture already does that. But for architecture, it's unique. And, um, you know, the project that we have heard of Ariane's that we included in the show, The Birds and the Bees, is looking at a traditional building envelope and the ways in which that envelope, specific, specifically in terms of the cladding panels, could be designed in such a way to function as a kind of secondary habitat for birds. Um, Joyce Wong is another architect. Uh, she teaches at, at, in Buffalo, University of Buffalo, who does a lot of work for, for non-human for non inhabitation. So I think that there's an interesting space of design where architects are starting to think about within this broader context of, of reassessing the a kind of anthropocentric worldview, thinking about the ways in which we inhabit the world and by extension produce architecture through which we inhabit the world, more in terms of a coexistence model, coexisting with the other, the other being nature in its various forms, whether it's plant life or it's wildlife, um, that that's opening up a completely different way of thinking about design uh, that has both obviously functional programmatic implications, but also aesthetic ones. Um, so I think that's something, another kind of, something else the pandemic has exposed. Um, uh, almost kind of accidentally. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of interesting references here. We just for uh, our audience, and we will try to work on making the lecture available and all those references uh, and uh, names that some of these clarifying questions are hinting to um, will be made available as well. Uh, Louise uh, Brookman is asking, saying, "Hi, Chris and Catherine." Do you reference uh, Gilles Clement and Marty Franks's work? And have you read Julian Raxworth's Overgrown book? Um, we have G. Clement, who is definitely um, one of my one of my favorites. Um, and actually, Ariane, who Chris was just talking about, um, she has a book. Um, it's really dealing with a post-human territory. Isn't that the title? Is it post-human territory? Yeah, but so, yeah. um, she, uh, Ariane, is bilingual, and she actually translated. Um, one of G. Clement's pieces that was lesser, uh, lesser known. So he's been extremely influential, I would say, um, to our thinking. Um, I really like his, um, you know, combination of thinking through species. You know, he's a, uh, we're, we're interested in vegetal consciousness, right? And, and, and that's something which um, he certainly is, is hinting at in various ways. And I think in general, um, experimental uh, landscape practice is really happening much more so in France than it is here. And I would say that he's, he's an epicenter of that. And curiously enough, the, the experimental stuff is really happening at the School of Versailles 
um, and that's where, where he teaches. And I think at some point, actually, Ariel was pondering doing a degree with him, uh, which I, I learned that recently. But um, yeah, so he's extremely influential. I, um, I introduce his texts when I teach seminars. I typically um, do a lecture on Gilles Clement and, and um, talk about some of his, uh, Jardin en Mouvement is one of uh, his pieces. Uh, Thierry Paysage, um, he's talking about, he, he's not necessarily privileging a native plant over something which is just an opportunistic plant. So um, I'm sure you've seen those, those images of the overgrowth of the High Line prior to its current design um, by Corner and Diller Scafidio. Um, those, those images became iconic and actually became the kind of inspiration for the planting strategy. So P.A. Udelt is the one who actually designed the planting strategy, which um, they're related, I would say, P.A. and, and G. Clement. G. Clement is much more coming from a philosophical perspective about uh, kind of decentering the human relative to vegetal plant matter. Um, and there's a wonderful project of his called Ile de Bronze. And it's, 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 it's a great example of something which is not for humans at all. And, and um, the Folly project that we showed you all um, is, is in a similar spirit. So the Ile de Bronze is, is a massive concrete island in the middle of a park that is not, uh, humans cannot get on top of it. And they've allowed you know, various native plants to seed in on the top. So you can take a picnic uh, near the bottom of it but it's really becomes this kind of monumental figure to what he refers to as the third landscape. Um, so he's been super influential to us um, and our thinking. I'm, I'm relatively new to Julian Raxworthy, um, just coming from my research this summer. Um, and I'm really interested in what, what he's up to. And I hope to get into an exchange with him uh, about this idea of decolonization of the history because landscape history does not have, um, as many participants or volumes or as architecture. There's, there's, it's, it's been through so many iterations um, that uh, that work is being done now, I'd say. And it, it you know, certain projects, urban projects like the High Line, uh, we might be tired of talking about it, but it did have a massive impact on people's awareness of landscape architecture as something more than problem solving, dealing with issues of public space and cities. Um, and, um, you know, kind of really um, going deep uh, with the history of what it is. But the term landscape architecture didn't really take hold until the 20th century. So we've been called, you know, paysagiste is what um, uh, Gilles Clement would um, call himself. And then you have, you know, gardener, you have all these different um, engineers, landscape engineers. Um, but the, the heritage is not as uh, clearly understood, I would say, as architectural history. It's mm -hmm. kind of interesting territory. Um, I would, there are still two more questions and we're way past our uh, expected time frame. So uh, I, if you'd like to still take those uh, questions, that would be great. And in the meantime, if there is any other questions from the residents, uh, please feel free to unmute um, and, and, and ask. So I'll take uh, Amy's uh, chalouette Charlotte, excuse me if I'm not pronouncing the name correctly. Um, she's asking, do you intend at any point for your work and your designs to actually become regenerative and not just an aesthetic thought experiment of what could happen, especially as populations are moving into more rural communities? How do you align your study with an actual practical application of creating a design that returns to the earth and to the non-human forms that share our planet. Your folly in the backyard, for example, sounds fascinating and has trees that will take a lifetime to grow. And at, that, at what point is it more than just an awareness piece? Well, it's a good question. Um, it's a question we ask ourselves on a regular basis. Um, in terms of just the scope of the practice and <clears throat> whether or not to, to move more assertively into client-based work. Um, Catherine has done some, some client-based work in terms of landscape work in the Hudson Valley. Um, uh, and, and if so, how, how much of that? 
I mean, I guess, you know, one response would be that um, first and foremost, uh, we're interested in pursuing what we're interested in pursuing um, and the degree to which uh, certain real world constraints inhibit that, it gives us pause. Uh, on the other hand, it presents an interesting challenge. I mean, one example would be the Folly Project, which uh, initiated um, during our residency at McDowell and then developed into a proposal uh, which we started doing some grant money raising, raising some grant money for. And that's something that we saw as, and it's kind of ongoing, so that's something that we continue to revisit, but that's something that we see as, as certainly buildable and ideally something that we would want to build. Um, I mean, that's a different kind of project. If it were to be built, it would, it would have a function in the world. It wouldn't have a function in the world the way a conventional building would, but as a folly, it would be functioning in different ways. Um, that would be more in terms of meaning and awareness building. But at the same time, and one of the things that we are interested in with that particular project is that while its function is maybe more poetic and cognitive for the human, it's actually entirely practical for the non-human. It becomes a habitat for vegetation and wildlife. So we were kind of interested in, in flipping this kind of assumption like, oh, well, when you do architecture and you design a building, then it functions for people. So, so that's its kind of programmatic functionality, the idea that this, this thing would function in a very prosaic way, but it would do so not for humans, but for the non-human was an interesting kind of way of flipping the typical expectation. But yeah, I think, I mean, I don't know, I mean, maybe Catherine wants to weigh in, but um, I mean, we, we very much see the practice as open-ended. Uh, we, we haven't fixed it in any way to say, okay, we're interested in doing this kind of work exclusively. Um, we are really interested in discourse. So we're interested in work that, 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 that operates at a discursive level, a level of ideas and, and inquiry um, and, and invention, obviously. But the degree to which that eventually travels into the world, so to speak, and materializes in certain ways is certain, certainly a possibility that we continue to talk about. And I, I guess I, I agree um, with how you, I, I really love the question. Um, and I guess, you know, some of the work that I'm doing right now with Basilica um, and their net zero landscape is deeply, uh, deeply application oriented and deeply practical. Um, and I'm, I'm enjoying, um, you know, being a part of that process. There's a, some really exciting stuff. There's a press release that's going to be coming out soon about it. Like most things, you know, there was a bit of a hiatus um, because of uh, the coronavirus, but they've started a new partnership with uh, the Canary Project, which is now called Toolshed. Um, and these are fine art practitioners who've done quite a bit of work in this area. It's very much um, asking similar questions that Chris and I are asking with Noom Studio. Um, and you know, for them, this kind of hybrid space that they're in, I think is a newly kind of practical application type of thing. Um, and when you get involved on that level, you need a lot of, uh, especially when you talk about cross-disciplinary, we don't want to get into territory of like becoming a pseudo expert on something. We, you know, you have to work in teams. And um, there, there's a, there's a lot of different forms of expertise that are coming together, including solar energy people, including the, um, the biomass collecting people, the converting. And, and some of these things are done um, in a way where, you know, they're asking the question too of like, oh, okay, this container that smells like fetid organic material because it's, you know, in the process of turning into fuel, how are we gonna, you know, make that acceptable next to a garden, which is about like a show garden, teaching garden for agricultural practice in a contaminated site. So it brings up some deeply per pragmatic issues, but also, and always, you know, the experiential and aesthetic uh, qualities of what we can do with these kinds of materials and processes in public space. Catherine and Chris, I'll take the last question, if you can briefly perhaps respond to that before uh, we uh, wrap up this um, uh, event today. Uh, it is coming from Lauren Henking. Lauren, uh, thanks for coming back. Uh, <laughs> it, it feels like a familiar person we haven't never met before, but uh, uh, there, there you are uh, this time again. It's 
thank you for coming back. So she's asking, uh, you talked a lot about ambiguity, which I think is so important in terms of shifting our expectations of what landscape should be. Do you think that our relationship to landscape would shift if the notion of landscape in the urban environment wasn't so prescribed and left more room for an ambiguous engagement? Um, <laughs> sure. Yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> um, on some level, I mean, this is something that <clears throat> we've been talking quite a bit about uh, more recently. Um, the the inter the interest in ambiguity, and obviously, one could 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 come up with other terms that that have similar implications. I think on some really fundamental level, has to do with and it goes beyond architecture and landscape architecture because on some level, you know, I think any, any kind of disciplinary engagement uh, is really just a way of, of being in the world ultimately, right? Through your work, uh, through the discipline you've chosen or the disciplines if you're, you're, you're engaging more than one, really becomes a kind of prosthetic for, for how you are in the world uh, and how you gauge, in, engage the world both literally and figuratively. And so I think for, you know, for us, this idea of ambiguity on some really basic level has to do with a broader, a broader question of permanence and impermanence. It go, moves into other things that we've been reading of late. It moves into uh, the space of, um, of, of kind of spiritual practices. If you think about um, what's become quite uh, prevalent in the last decade or so of mindfulness uh, and how that's moving through different aspects of Western culture, which is really a kind of intersection of, of Freudian kind of psychological practice, psychotherapy with Zen Buddhism. And on some level, it really has to do with uh, thinking about ways in which we are in the world as humans, as a species, as a civilization, that comes to terms with the ultimate impermanence of the world. And that the story certainly of Western civilization is largely one, whether it's through institutions or through disciplines like architecture that erect buildings that want to stand for the ages and resist the wear and tear of time um, or any, uh, any other variety of social, cultural, uh, kind of political systems, the, the human orientation has been one, at least on an unconscious, if not a conscious level to resist that fundamental impermanence. I mean, the, the ultimate impermanence is that, that our lives are temporal. You know, we're, we're born and at some point we die. Um, and the idea, on, it, it sounds very simple, but it's also quite profound that the world is fundamentally about impermanence. I think landscape architecture does differ quite dramatically from architecture because whereas arguably architecture, I mean, there's a whole history of architecture and architectural practices that have tried to engage questions of of provisionality or impermanence over the years, certainly within the 20th century of 20th century modernism. But for the most part, it's a discipline that has really tried to reinforce through its support of, of specific institutions and their identities, ideas of permanence as a kind of bulwark against the forces of impermanence, whereas <clears throat> landscape architecture is about time. And so it's fundamentally about impermanence or some, de some degree of permanence and impermanence. Um, but I think that that idea of impermanence and, and how one comes to terms with impermanence as a way of being in the world and then how that flows into one's work in the world. In our case, it has to do with art design, curation, architecture, landscape architecture is where ultimately, <clears throat> whether we use the term ambiguity, which is a kind of both and literally in terms of the etymology of the word and be, um, or a term like impermanence, it has to do with a kind of provisionality. It has to do with a temporal condition, uh, a kind of instability. And then it's a question of how that, that fundamental concept of instability, impermanence, provisionality um, is worked with in a way that has, has, um, has creative, um, creative implications and, and, and forms of production. Uh, but that also serve to to orient us and orient us in in a different way. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> it's it's kind of a philosophical response. But I guess on some and I don't know if it answers the question. And maybe Catherine can weigh in. But 
I think on some level, the interest in ambiguity, whatever term one wants to use, at whatever scale design within whichever discipline, whether it's architecture, landscape, art, or all three, uh, in the world or about the world, <clears throat> I think on some level is fundamentally about engaging the world in such a way that one begins to work with the world in such a way that one is coming to terms with this fundamental impermanence that is what characterizes <clears throat> our, <clears throat> our place in the world. I would um, say that there's an interest and in it's, it's also something that goes back um, to the 18th century origins as we were talking about um, at the outset and a number of different things that convened in that time period. Um, and one of the really important aspects of picturesque thinking was the idea of multiple temporal consciousness and as, a, as separate and apart from the beautiful, which is an instantaneous, right? You see a beautiful person like, wow, that person is beautiful. And the sublime, which is really about the infinite. So the time value there, I believe, came out of thinking about uh, ecological systems and how they function, right? And we always have an idea of multiple, multiple, uh, more than we can even conceive of, timelines. Of, of creatures and habitats um, that are all coexisting with one another on their own timelines, right? And very interesting to, as a, in terms of our practice is very dynamic. I said, I, you know, I bring the shaggy, he brings the axo, and then, you know, I bring this kind of like, you know, really abstract mm -hmm. uh, kind of relationship to time, uh, which, you know, has, has its good points and its bad points. But if you want to see a, a very nice meditation on, on uh, what happens when an architect applies, you know, columnar architectural thinking of, of permanence to trees, there's a really nice chapter in that, uh, the book Overgrown that I mentioned, where um, through a series of mishaps and, and, you know, architectural desires of a smooth surface and limestone, they're basically set up a system that was gradually killing trees um, because of what it looked like. And those trees do not want to behave the way a column might behave. And there's, there's um, quite a bit to be learned from that. Um, so I would say that the way we are thinking and working is totally decoupled from a modernist practice that doesn't really want to know what's below that ground plane. Um, and, you know, for me, that's a, that's a very important part of, of the question of ambiguity, right? Because we, uh, we can, we can test and we can surmise and we can study and we can, we can get a lot of data, but ultimately the extent to which uh, our knowledge is functioning is only uh, the extent to which we're, we're applying it in those areas. So um, the limits are, are, are really not palpable, at least mm. for me. And that's both time mm. and material. Thank you very much both and thank you to our audience and for engaging and asking all so many questions. Um, I certainly enjoy very much the, the, the discourse. I enjoy the, the humor that you bring in and paired with, with the urgency of, of the questions that are being asked uh, is quite fascinating. Um, so thank you both very, very much. Uh, and uh, the residents will have a chance to keep talking and discussing with you afterwards while they share with you uh, the works that they have uh, produced um, and their ideas that are in development right now. Um, so that, that is uh, to be continued. Um, so I will pass it on to Celia. Uh, and perhaps maybe if you'd like to, be before I do, so if there is any, uh, you know, Closing, in closing, you know, what would you recommend to um, young professionals or students uh, to what, what would you have them carry forward, you know, or one message that you would like them to, to remember uh, as they, you know, progress in, in the world? I guess I would say that um you know, specifically coming from a landscape perspective, it's pretty cool that there were a number of questions um, relating to some of the references and um, that there's a, there's a really large opportunity to apply um, the kind of theoretical um, um, design thinking that one learns as an architect to the world of, of landscape architecture.
but I would say in, 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 a, in, a, in a larger context of asking these kinds of questions and, and really thinking about how these um, types of interventions that are things which we have not really seen previously, um, there's, there's a lot of room for experimentation there. And I think it's incredibly exciting. And I, you know, I mentioned the part of uh, doing all this research and really trying to find experimental landscape practitioners. We wanted G. Clement, by the way, in the show, whoever asked that question, um, we couldn't get him. And then there, we found the artist, Piero Gallardi, um, who's Italian, not terribly known here. We wanted him in the show, too expensive to ship his works. Um, those are some really interesting people. But I, I think, it, you know, architects are known uh, in terms of how you're trained in most schools to be radically experimental. And um, for me, applying that kind mm -hmm. of thinking to these larger questions is absolutely a huge opportunity. Yeah, I would, I would just say um, to, to, be in, <clears throat> to be inquisitive and to, in, in the spirit of ambiguity, embrace the unfamiliar. Um, because I think these disciplines and certainly what makes them interesting and inherently ambiguous, um, certainly architecture, architecture is inherently ambiguous and has been debated for centuries uh, in terms of it being situated somewhere between uh, the sciences, engineering and the arts, humanities. <clears throat> There's a great piece by um, the architectural theorist, uh, Mark Wigley that he wrote um, back in the early nineties for uh, a journal called Assemblage. And um, I forget the exact title of the article, but it's on uh, the on architecture as prosthetic. And he uses the prosthetic as a kind of analog for thinking about the discipline in terms of it being an extension of other things. If the prosthetic is an extension of some other body. Um, that architecture uh, has always existed in this space of extension of being an extension of the sciences, of engineering, uh, of urban planning, at the same time an extension of philosophy, the humanities, uh, the arts. Um, and as a result is inherently ambiguous. And I think certainly for me, for us, uh, you know, drawn to it for that reason, which is that it, it kind of, it's a difficult, it's a difficult discipline precisely because of its ambiguity and because of its kind of impermanent status uh, as a discipline. And of course, the debates continue over how the, how the discipline orients itself in the world. Should it be more engaged with the world? Uh, at what point in engaging the world does it lose its autonomy, its creative intellectual autonomy or agency? Uh, if it retreats too much from the world, at what point does it become isolated and lose the potential for influence? Uh, so, so many interesting debates that still, in a productive way, I would say, haunt the discipline precisely because of its inherent ambiguity um, that, that really makes it, uh, and I would say similarly for landscape architecture, uh, makes it a discipline that's inherently about being inquisitive and about the unfamiliar and about operating in a space of, of ambiguity and impermanence. Mm. Part of your message, I guess, is keep reading, read, read, read. Yes. <laughs> read <it. laughs> a lot of references and explore and experiment. There seems to be a lot of room uh, to engage. So um, I'll pass it on to Celia. Thank you again. Thank you. That was great. Thank you Thanks. so much.